friends, welcome to Psychiatry Education Forum Academy's updates. So we have a new antidepressant just received FDA approval for major depressive disorder. And the medicine is the Japeron hydrochloride. And the name they have given this medicine is Exua. I hope I'm saying it right. But I will be discussing this medication in these various sections. And friends, I am Dr. Harbinder Singh, creator of Psychiatry Education Forum Academy. Before I move forward, I want to emphasize I have no disclosures, no financial ties with this pharmaceutical company or with any pharmaceutical company for that matters. So this new medication, so this pharmaceutical company just announced that they have received the FDA approval for Exua. And uh, according to them, this is the first and only oral selective serotonin 1A receptor agonist. And this was published on September 28, 2023. So I reviewed the data on this medication. Looks like this was, uh, this uh, took more than a decade to get the approval. And I believe FDA refused almost three times before receiving this approval now. I, I think more than 10 years passed, uh, but finally they received the approval. But let's discuss a little bit more on this medication only from a clinically relevant standpoint. So first, it's only indicated for major depressive disorder in adults, not in children's, and no other indication received right now. And uh, when I looked at the literature, there are studies showing efficacy for um, anxiety, uh, efficacy for low sexual drive uh, with major depressive disorder, uh, so this is in that uh, aziprone class, that the buspiron class. So this is very similar class in terms of action on serotonin 1A receptor. So let's understand the mechanism of action. How is this antidepressant different than other antidepressant if this is? Well, they mentioned obviously the exact mechanism is not known but they are postulating this as selective agonist at serotonin 1A receptor. And based on the studies I reviewed, looks like this is more selective on this receptor compared to the SSRI and SNRI class. And um, so I'm assuming this will be in the serotonin modulator class where vulazidone and vortioxetine is. But we all know that velocidone is a partial serotonin 1A agonist and vortioxetine is full serotonin 1A agonist, but vortioxetine has more mechanism of action. According to the data given by um, this medication package insert, looks like no other mechanism is given other than being selective at serotonin 1A receptor. So very briefly, I will not waste more time here, but this is a diagram I created uh, for our academy members. We have lectures on how these me medications work. So on top, we have presynaptic neuron. On, on bottom, we have postsynaptic neuron. And, you know, serotonin is a complex system, but we are only focusing on serotonin 1A receptors. And you can see that there is a serotonin 1A on the presynaptic neuron, and this is an autoreceptor. What that means is it's in red. It's a break. If this receptor is activated, it reduces the flow of serotonin. And the one on the postsynaptic is the one which is responsible for improvement in the mood and cognition. Now, uh, mainly mood, sorry, depression. That is what this receptor is uh, known for. And uh, most of the medication indirectly activates it by increasing the serotonin in the synapse. 
uh, and the the serotonin one A on the presynaptic uh, takes time to desensitize. That's why most of the antidepressant takes three to four weeks. But that was the rationale for serotonin modulators that work on serotonin 1A, that the desensitization happens early, so the onset of response is faster, theoretically. Now, that is what they are postulating, likely that there is a combination effect of desensitizing the autoreceptor, 5-HT1A autoreceptor on the presynaptic neuron and activation of the postsynaptic uh, serotonin 1A. But friends, uh, I'm talking to our academy members. If you're interested in learning more, we have very detailed lectures on this in our major depressive disorder section, where I have talked more on these slides on serotonin basics and beyond mechanism of action of each antidepressant. And also we have compared vortioxetine and velazodone. I want you to please watch that and see how these two medicines are same or different than j -Piron. Now, moving on, how will you dose this medication? So this medication is available in four extended release tablets. So this is an extended release formulation, 18.2, 36.3, 54.5, and 72.6. I still un don't understand the reason for these. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I should not go there, but the dosage is very interesting with the points um, there. But before we go into how to dose, there are very strict requirement before you dose. So you need to check certain things before even considering this medication. So a patient comes to you and you're planning to consider j -Piron. First, you need to order an EKG. And there is a second thing you need to do, but let's talk about EKG, ECG, electrocardiogram. Why do you need that? Because this is one of those antidepressants that can prolong QTC. So far, we have we know that higher dosing of citalopram and acetalopram can do QTC prolongation at higher doses, not at therapeutic doses. Um, but there is no other antidepressant that has this strict uh, Q, uh, e ECG requirement because this has evident QTC prolongation effect. And for that reason, this is contraindicated in patients who have prolonged QT syndrome, long QT syndrome congenitally speaking. And uh, if you do the baseline ECG and QTC is more than 450, this is not the medication for the patient. So you do not initiate it. And also it's not just baseline. You need to perform ECG periodically, like before initiating, during every dose titration, and periodically during the treatment. But the frequency will increase for ECG monitoring if you, if a patient is also on other medication that has pro, uh, potential to prolong QT interval. So you need to be mindful of that. We have a different chapter on that. So I will not spend time on that. And if a patient develop more than 450 millisecond uh, of the QTC prolongation during treatment. Now, this is really interesting. They did not mention to stop uh, uh, j -Piron once the QTC is prolonged during treatment, but they did mention that do not titrate the dose up if QTC goes beyond 450 millisecond. I will be very hesitant to continue the medication if you're noticing QTC prolongation during the treatment, but it's not mentioned in the contraindication, so I'll not talk more on that. But there's one more uh, thing. Uh, if there are other conditions that can uh, increase the risk of developing torsad D points, and very briefly, these conditions are these. A patient with uncontrolled or significant cardiac disease, recent MI, heart failure, unstable angina, bradyarrhythmias, uncontrolled hypertension, high degree AV block, severe aortic stenosis, and uncontrolled hypothyroidism. So heart and thyroid is the target. You need to get full history, um, may need a cardiac clearance for some patient. But I, I will emphasize with the ECG, always check the TSH with the reflex to free T4. 
just to check the hypothyroidism status because that can also increase the risk of QTC prolongation and placing a patient at risk of developing a torsades, which can, which will be life threatening if it happens. So, number one is you check ECG. Number two is you have to check the electrolytes and correct them because that will increase the risk of QTC prolongation indirectly. So you always check prior to initiating the treatment and uh, you always monitor electrolyte during the dose titration and you will do it periodically for patients who are at risk of electrolyte abnormalities or if they are receiving diuretics or glucocorticoids or there is a history of hypokalemia or hypomagnesemia. So you see how ECG and electrolyte uh, monitoring is needed before starting it and with every dose titration. So this is, I think, the most clinically relevant thing before you start it. Now, you have done these two things. They are good. You are ready to move forward. Let's see how will you dose it. First, you have to take it with food at same time each day, approximately same time each day. You all do not split it, crush it, or chew it because this is an extended release tablet. And the starting dose is 18.2 milligram. And after three days, based on the response, if not happening, you can go to 36.3. And by day seven, you can go to 54.5. And after a week, if response is still not happening, you can go to the max dose of 72.6 milligram. But this dosage is different for specific population. First, in elderly, in geriatric population, you start low. Second, if a patient ha has a moderate hepatic impairment. And third, if the creatinine clearance is less than 50 ml per minute. In these, starting dose is 18.2, but after seven days, you go to 36.3. So you don't titrate faster, and the max dosage in this population is 36.3. And the other thing is, uh, I want to go back to this uh, liver and kidney here. So with mild hepatic impairment, you do the usual on top, no dosage adjustment needed. And with severe hepatic impairment, it's contraindicated. I will talk about that in next slide, but severe hepatic impairment is a big no. And same with creatinine clearance, more than 50, you use the, do the usual titration as discussed on top. Now, the other thing to keep an eye on is, if a patient is on cytochrome P450 3A4 inhibitors, and it depends on if this is a moderate inhibitor or a strong inhibitor. So a patient on moderate inhibitor, you reduce the dose of Japeron by 50%. And if on a strong, you avoid it. So that's another contraindication. So that's the next topic. What are the contraindications where you will not do it? First, obviously, congenital long QT syndrome. We already talked about it or at baseline QTC is more than 450 millisecond, we already talked about it, or in severe hepatic impairment, we just discussed that, and strong 3A4 inhibitors. And the other are like, obviously, if a patient is allergic to any component, you don't do it, or there is a risk of that serotonin syndrome, like those things, I'm not going with the MAOIs, we already know about those. Now, the next thing to know is, in the studies, what were the most common adverse events, which is defined as 5% or more than the placebo? Now, first, they have more GI side effects. First is dyspepsia. Second is abdominal pain. And then we have nausea. So these are the common GI symptoms. And then we have dizziness with the blood pressure effect and insomnia. But these two, nausea and dizziness, were the most common resulting in discontinuation of the medication. So very important to recommend taking it with food. And actually, I didn't mention it. Food is must for, for, for you to, for this medication to be absorbed. So it has to be taken with food. And that should prevent many of these symptoms. 
but I will not go into treatment of nausea with antidepressant. That's a totally separate lecture, but you treat, you dose accordingly. Uh, now, this insomnia is a little bit tricky because when these symptoms are present, I always recommend uh, starting at dinner time. Uh, but keep an eye on insomnia, maybe um, morning uh, breakfast or lunch time will be appropriate. But whichever time you choose, it should be same time every day. Now, the last thing about this medication is the pregnancy risk. So they have mentioned that use during third trimester may increase the following risk in neonate. First is the risk of persistent pulmonary hypertension. And second is symptoms of poor adaptation in neonate, like respiratory distress, temperature instability, feeding difficulty, hypotonia, irritability. So based on this, I mean, the data is not there yet. It's a new medication. Same way data is not there for lactation. Uh, so overall, not very positive data for pregnancy at this time, but let's wait for more studies. So friends, this was a very basic overview about this medication. I hope this was clinically relevant, but I will recommend to all our med medical professionals, if you're interested in learning more, please consider joining our academy membership. Go to psychiatryeducationforum.com to learn more. But this is Dr. Singh signing off. You all take care and bye for now. Thank you again.